I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Sri Lanka. <coughs> Mr. President, <coughs> distinguished delegates, it is said that you don't make peace with friends. You make it with unsavory enemies if it has to be. My dear friends, peace talks are always a complex mix of strategic calculation and human emotion. It has been the experience of those working on peace building programs and researching peace and conflict that it is important to pay attention to both factors to understand why talks may or may not succeed. Between 1946 and 2005, only 39 of 288 conflicts, or 13.5%, ended in peace agreements, according to research initiatives. The others ended in victory for one side, or an end to fighting without a peace agreement, or a victory, straightforward. My dear friends, there is also evidence that even failed peace agreements reduce the intensity of future conflict. But even when warring parties fail to reach a peace agreement, talks reduce civilian casualties through temporary ceasefires or the establishment of humanitarian corridors to deliver supplies or evacuate civilians. Distinguished delegates, peace talks can create a foundation for an eventual agreement to end conflict. They can also reduce harm to communities. We must, therefore, strenuously exploit the crisis, explore the mechanisms of peace negotiations to its utmost with optimism if we are to succeed in this instance, the easy path of enforcing majoritarian decisions does not, respectfully I say, address the equities in the dispute resolution mechanism when it comes to peace talks. Mr. President, Sri Lanka therefore remains deeply concerned about the situation in Ukraine. We call on all parties to exercise maximum restraint and work towards the cessation of hostilities in order to bring about peace, security, and stability in the region. Sri Lanka emphasizes the need for concerted efforts to resolve the situation through diplomacy and dialogue in the pursuit of peace. As someone said, the spiral of death and devastation, which is growing on a daily basis, does nothing but destroy even the little trust and hope there is between the parties to the conflict that peace was achievable. My dear friends, we must appreciate that globally it has impacted on the recovery of economies post-COVID and on people's livelihoods and all countries, inclusive of my own Sri Lanka, is affected by increased food prices, energy prices, high inflation and a debt servicing crisis and increased levels of migration. Mr. President, it is important that both sides must realize that they are being prejudiced by the status quo, but also know that they cannot have any tangible military advantage. Mr. President, the only logical way then forward is negotiations. And it is in negotiations that we must place our trust in. We believe that negotiations often supported by neutral mediators must work to arrive at some version of a solution whereby both parties feel that they have won something. They must endeavor to craft an agreement that creates an environment of mutual gain, whether it be political or material. My dear friends, we need to be sensitive to the reality that negotiators must not only reach an agreement, but also sell that agreement to a community that is bitter, a community that is traumatized, and a community that is surely 
grieving. We must always be aware that there are strong reasons to include also women, community organizers, and different ethnic leaders in peace talks. Their inclusion means that public acceptance of any peace deal grows as negotiations proceed. It is known that women and youth and community leaders bring a different dimension, which is far more conciliatory as they are more sensitive to the needs of our future generations. My dear friends, talking with the generals who are in the battlefield and the political leaders alone may not yield the best results. But what we see historically is the common model, of course. And this might well be the case in the case of Ukraine and Russia, that it would still be up to a few elite men to negotiate an agreement. And that might not really work as best as it ought to. Mr. President, two billion people live in countries affected by conflict and humanitarian crises. I do not need to stress the importance of peace, for without peace, no progress is possible. I am reminded of an observation of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, when he said that there is a global famine for peace. A global famine for peace. That is the pitiful state that we have successfully brought the world to be in the prosecution of our greed for global power. What does it, I think it was Thomas More, Sir Thomas, Thomas More, who said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Mr. President, we have convened once again, about a year since the conflict in Ukraine broke out into aggression, creating manifest woeful consequences, both in Ukraine and around the world. During this time, this assembly has met five times before and adopted by what a number of resolutions. After one year, we have not reached a solution, nor do we see one in sight, most respectfully. Instead, the negative consequences of war and conflict continue to reverberate around the world. My dear friends, if we are to find the much-needed respite for all concerned, we must not give up on diplomacy and our hope for a future based on peace and prosperity. We therefore appeal to the principal parties and the universal community to turn to without any further delay to other mechanisms that include genuine dialogue and a sincere search for peace. The talks will likely be long and arduous and require smaller, confidence-building steps, but it can surely be brought to an end if we genuinely address the fundamentals that triggered the dispute. Finally, my dear friends, the resolution that we are looking at, entitled Principles Underlying a Comprehensive, Just, and Lasting Peace in Ukraine, is before this assembly for consideration. It is imperative, I say, that such initiatives address not just the effects or the outcome that is evident, but the root causes that led to the conflict. If such root causes are left unaddressed, any peace, leave alone a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in Ukraine would be elusive. It is Sri Lanka's hope that the decision we would contribute towards this, this endeavor and would not be used as another step towards recriminations and posturing that would aggravate an already inflamed situation. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of Sri Lanka.